Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Project. Sunday School Lesson, Jesus is Resurrected for Sunday, November the 8th. Doris, will you open us with a word of prayer, please? Father, we come to you and, and we thank you for the protection that you've provided through the storm, but things were physical damage and not life damage. Father, we just as we go into this lesson today, we thank you for the ability to be able to study your word no matter where we happen to be. And we ask that you open our hearts to the study of the empty tomb and for what Christ has done for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It may seem odd to study the resurrection right before Christmas and not close to Easter when we're going to study it again. But it is the basis of our salvation, and so it, uh, it behooves us to, to look back on it continually. And this lesson gives us an opportunity to do that. Uh, in the introduction, the book lists several things that uh, children are told, uh, such as swallowing uh, a seed or cause something to grow in your stomach or... Um, or that Santa Claus keeps the list and his elves watch to make sure that you're good. And the question really is, um, how does that affect, how, how does believing those things as a child affect the child's behavior? Um, I always kind of wasn't sure about that black cat crossing my path thing as a child. And so when that happened, and it was kind of rare, but it would happen, I would turn and go the other way, turn around in a circle, you know, whatever I had heard is the latest thing to do for the black cat crosses your path. So the, the question in the front of our minds as we study the resurrection is how does this event, how does this belief in the resurrection of Christ um, affect our behavior? What does it mean to us? Uh, daily in our in our minds, in our activities, in our uh, actions. How does it go beyond belief? Well, and this is also looking at cultural things that we're told. I mean, we joke about the don't drink coffee, it will stunt your growth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, don't swallow the seed. Don't, um, don't swallow your gum. All, all those kind of things but the idea is when we hear something over and over again that has an action and a consequence we start hanging on to it we start um, we start believing it whether it's true or not if you were a kid and you were told that if you ate the watermelon seed you were going to grow a watermelon in your belly uh, you probably swallowed a couple seeds just to see if it would happen because you were testing that belief of believing the people around you and what they told you. Sure. Joyce, will you read our first set of verses for us, please? This comes from John 21 through 2. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw the stone had been rolled, had been moved, removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where, we, where they've put him. Thank you. Mary Magdalene was demon possessed when Jesus encountered her and he um, cast out those demons and cured her of that uh, affliction. So, she had good reason to follow him, to believe in him, uh, to believe in his divinity, and uh, and to come here this day and uh, prepare his body for permanent burial. Christ had been crucified right before the Sabbath, and they really didn't have time to do anything except wrap his body and put him in the tomb, lay him in the tomb before the Sabbath, so she was coming to uh, anoint him, to embalm, and to, to begin the process of burying him permanently. But she noticed that the stone had been removed from the 
to her, to her thinking, um, she probably imagined that they had moved his body to a permanent place of burial because this, this was a sudden rush, borrowed tomb, just lay him somewhere for the Sabbath. She didn't yet understand really that he had been resurrected. She didn't enter the tomb. She, she didn't just enter the saw tomb. that the stone was removed. That's correct. It's interesting though that her reaction was um, to begin spreading the gospel. She went back and told people that he wasn't in the tomb, that something was meant. And even though she didn't understand yet, um, because she had followed Christ and because she believed in him, her natural reaction was to go and tell others what was happening concerning him. She also did a, a smart thing in the culture by going and telling some men to come and observe. Because in the Jewish tradition, um, a woman's testimony was not valid. It was not legal. It was not trustworthy enough to be believed if it ever came, uh, if, if a question ever arose. So she, she went and told the disciples so they could come and confirm that that was true. And because in that tradition, the, the female did not have the right to be a witness. And also in Mary's case, She'd been through so much that even, I think, even if she'd had the right to be a witness, she probably wouldn't have been believed because of, um, because of the things that had already gone on in, in her life. That's, she was not, true. was not exactly a, a woman of the best reputation. That's the way to say it, yeah. Um, look now from the disciples' perspective, too. They're in hiding. They're together, but they're removed. They've separated themselves because Jesus has been, they know, falsely accused and arrested and beaten and crucified. And they don't know, uh, but that that fate awaits them. And so they're, you know, not really keen, I would think, initially to go out in public and uh and investigate what she's saying to them so it, it says a lot for them that um that they did uh, that she knew where they were they trusted her they believed her and um and they overcame those, those fears that they had and that's because god uses unexpected and unconventional people he uses people, no matter what their situation is, to be able to spread his word. If it was all perfect cookie cutter, you can only spread the word if you're this or this or this, word would not have traveled very far. That is true. It, we, we see in all of this that exposure to Christ and belief in him prompted people to act in a way that supported the prophecies and supported the spreading of the gospel once he was resurrected. Uh, we do know that Thomas now, we do know that Judas betrayed him. So we, we see that, that people can reject that influence. But it's, um, it's encouraging to see that just being around Jesus, uh, listening to him or reading faith, studying his word and his example, uh, prompted them to react in a Christian way, a Christ way. I'm not sure that I would lump Thomas and Judas together. Well, they're different examples. They're, yes, but um, but it's the same point but, that we can still vow and or reject. And because uh, and because God knows us so well and knows that we respond in different ways he has people that will just believe it by hearing and he has people who believe it by sight and he has people who will believe by touch and just by the time that they spent with christ so so we are different 
will you read our second set of verses? This is John 23 through 7. At that point, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were, two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping, da stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. The wrapping that had once been on his head was not lying with the linen clothes, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. So, you. so the disciples go running now. Picture the, the graveyard is normally in a hilly, stony place where caves can be dug or where they naturally exist. So it's not like just running down a smooth road, actually having climb in uh, and go around you know, rocks and boulders and that sort of thing. Um, graveyards at the time also tended to be rather overgrown. They were only kept in the sense that the bodies were, were kept and visited, but it was not the kind of nice cemetery sort of setting that we have today. So it, it's interesting that we believe John wrote the Gospel of John, and we believe that he was this other disciple who Jesus loved that was accompanying Peter. He makes the point of telling us that old man Peter fell behind, and John got ahead and got there first. Um, but in getting there first and being so anxious to be there first, as soon as he hits the tomb, he stops. He did. He waited. He waited for Peter, who it may have been because uh, within the last uh, 96 hours or so, he's watched Peter defend, try to defend Christ with a sword. He's watched this physical physicality of uh, protecting Christ. So he's thinking, I'll let him go in first. We, we do also think that Peter may have been the oldest disciple. He was certainly the most vocal. And um, so he he had a, a sort of leadership role in Christ, sadly. Um, not officially, but uh, but he seemed to play that part that the other disciples would listen to and follow him in his suggestions as they go. So Peter goes in and, um, and he sees that the body is actually gone. Uh, that's uh, definitive because it means Christ is either resurrected or his body has been moved. Uh, now they can begin to, to believe what Jesus told them about his death and resurrection at times. And um, if they can believe it factually because those linen cloths are there. Uh, remember when Lazarus was resurrected, he uh, um, came probably hopping out of the tomb because he was still wrapped up in the in the burial clothes. And the, and Jesus told the people you have to go remove those those wrappings from him so that he'll be free. Jesus didn't need anybody to remove his wrappings; he did it himself, and he left them there in the tomb because he no longer needed. Them. He was not going to die again like Lazarus was. Um, he was resurrected. The Jews could believe that because they were forbidden from touching uh, that body. It made them unclean. It made them unable to sacrifice. It made them unable to be with their families. It made them unable to eat. They really couldn't do anything in an unclean state until they went through purification ceremonies and were declared clean by the priests, uh, which could take days, it could take weeks, depending on the circumstances. So if they were going to move a body, they certainly wouldn't take the linen cloths off of it and move a, a, a body without those and touch that skin, that dead skin, because that would make them even more unclean. So for them to think that the body had been moved at that point just really wouldn't make sense to them because the cloths were there. Well, and the whole point of the stone 
from the Roman point of view was that there was going to be a stone and guard because they were scared that someone would steal the body. If you were going to steal the body, you would have, forgive me, you would have scooped and run. You would have picked the body up at, in its state and run away. So we, Christ leaving the clothes is important. But even more than that, the fact that it's not just like we keep referring back to Lazarus because Lazarus was one that was resurrected. Christ called him out of the tomb. He had to be unwrapped. That meant things were just cut or, or we have no idea. We're making this up as we go along. That things were just scattered. But Christ's clothes were, that burial clothes were there, but what covered his head was folded, neatly placed, like we're supposed to do with a napkin when we leave the table, because we're coming back. It's, it's an indication of, I'm doing this actual act. It's not that my body's been stolen. It's not that I just hurried out of here. Um, you know, the Victorians would have said, well, he wasn't really dead because of that whole bells on the coffin thing and his clothes were there. He left those because he doesn't need them. He's not going to need them. And he left them as proof that the body was gone, but the process was still going on the way he said it would, would go. That's correct. What do you think? You give me an A to the day. A plus plus plus. If, if you don't read out of first, go to first. This is John 20, 8 through 10. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, and believed. For they did not yet understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Never ever discount the effect of what you do. The, this other disciple, John, he believed, stopped at the entrance of the tomb, and Peter went in. When after Peter went in and saw what was there, John followed him. Just that simple act of stepping into the tomb prompted John to walk in, and um, the scripture says, believe at that point of stepping into the tomb and witnessing he believed. And we have that, the, those minor effects on people's, you know, not their salvation, but in their belief, in their seeking, in their, um, in, in their looking for God and Christ and salvation in their lives. Paul made a big deal out of this in, uh, in several places when he talked about not being a stumbling block. And, um, it really amounts to being a Christian, to being Christ-like, following Christ's example. The way Mary did naturally go and begin to share the gospel before she even understood what it meant. The way Peter did set this example of stepping into the tomb and witnessing and, and believing um, happened because they followed Christ, because they tried to emulate his life, his teaching, his uh, his way, and Christ sent us the uh, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, who will also, he said, guide us and convict us in the way to follow Him. And we have His Word, we have His Scripture, His full Scripture, uh, to read and to know uh, how we can react and how we can represent Him. When, uh, when unbelievers see us not being Christian, they may judge us, you know, to some degree, but Paul says their, their thought is not so much, oh, you must not be a Christian. It's more like, I don't need to be a Christian because, you know, I don't need to be acting like you're acting, um, doing what you're doing, believing what you seem to believe. Because we're going to be the light and salt of the world. They have to look at us and want Christ the way we have. I also was listening to Eric want to say that there are times, though, that 
people watch us, but we're not, as humans, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. It's how we recover from some of those mistakes and how we point people back to God during that, that time. Uh, we can study all day long and we can say, this is what they thought. This is what we have no idea. We can go by what is written. And, and you know, this is when I, if we were in class, I'd say, here, here you go, take my Sunday school thesis thing away. <laughs> we, we're like Mary. We try every day to do what we're supposed to do but we can't quite get to that next step. She went to the tomb to do a job. And because the stone was gone, because there was that, that change, that unexpected, she went to tell them what she thought. They ran to the tomb. You know, I have this picture of, uh, maybe I watched too many biblical movies from the 50s of people playing different characters. So I see an Anthony Quinn Peter, big old guy running and a younger, more fit passing him and him thinking, go ahead, son, because you're going to get there. You're going to wait for me anyway. He knew because Christ at this point had already told him upon you, upon my your rock, I will build my church. Peter had to walk in there first. I'm, I'm going to get the sideways look, so I'm not going to. Peter had to walk in there. Peter had to see it because Christ told him, upon your belief, I will build this church. Once he goes in, John's able to go in. doesn't mean that John loved him less. It just meant he needed Peter to go in first. Sometimes we need someone to go first. Somebody of times, a family that is lost, needs someone to make that decision to follow Christ so that other members of the family will follow Christ. That, that whole concept of, of leadership. And while I'm kind of digressing from the actual lesson, the thing is, there are days we are like Lazarus. We are alive and we are awake, awake, but we are bound by our death clothes. And we have to have Christ say to someone else, take those off that person. Make it where they can do their job, where they can do their work and, and go on. People watch us every day. Parents know this. Little children watch what's going on. As we get older, we look forward how older people handle situations. We're constantly watching and observing. And when we're looking at this kind of faith, we're watching them, but we're not judging them. Or are we? Well, we, we, everybody certainly judges from the perspective of, do I want to be like that person? Do I want to pursue what they have? Uh, or do I not? And um, and I, I think that judgment is fair um, because we, we certainly do want to emulate people that seem to emulate Christ better than we do. We want to look for the reasons. We want to understand what they know and believe and, and, uh, and the reasons that they do that. And we want to be that I'm going to say, you can take my Sunday school certificate, that we want to be filled with the Spirit, we want to be close enough to the Father to, to, uh, to serve in the, in the same way that they do. So we, we do compare ourselves in this thing. Uh, Joyce, will you read the fill in the blank section, please? Faith. Biblical faith is the resting or trusting in Christ alone for salvation. More than being simply a mental agreement of historical fact, genuine faith begins with a recognition and confession of the truth of the gospel, followed by receiving of Christ as Lord and Savior in one's life. Biblical faith is not blind faith. 
where it rests on the historical life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Do you believe if we don't believe there's no point in going forward? Uh, the voice from church history says, um, a marvelous and mighty paradox has thus occurred. For the death which they thought to inflict on him as dishonor and disgrace has become the glorious monument to death and defeat. Christ was crucified for our sin. He paid the penalty of death and separation for our sin, but he was innocent. He had lived a human sinless life. He paid that penalty and, and it didn't apply to him. So as the hymn says, death couldn't hold him in the grave. He was able to resurrect himself because he was innocent, because he was pure, because he was God. And, um, and that's something that we can never do. It is paradoxical that he both paid the price and is the purest being in the universe. But that willingness to serve on his part is what grants us salvation in kinship with Jesus, um, with the Father. <clears throat> Jesus said, love your enemies. Uh, he said, turn the other cheek. He demonstrated that definitively when he allowed himself to be arrested and accused and beaten and killed um, for our transgressions when he was innocent. Um, that's a tough act to follow. That's a high bar to, to look for. Um, but he is our example. Uh, studying his life and his work and following that example really is the best we can do. And it's all that God expects from us. And much like the race to the tomb and John getting to that point of being able to walk in but waiting for Peter, God provides in our life that person who's going to gently bump us into taking that step or doing what we're supposed to be doing. And once we do that, we're on, we're unaware of how many people are actually watching what we do every every day. That's right. So the question at the end is, what will you do today because you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ for your eternal life? And I, I think about that not in terms of, oh, I'm going to make a list of things I'm going to do but more in terms of how am I going to listen for the Spirit to guide me is to guide others, because that's what Jesus charged us to do, to be an example, to spread the word, not by beating people over the head of the Bible, but by being an example of him. So how can I be more like that today? Uh, and I can let him guide me in the, in the answer to that. And in the beginning, Eric said, uh, this is uh, kind of an odd time because we're coming up on the holiday season and Thanksgiving. And, and I would disagree. I think it's a perfect time because we need to be reminded every day about the resurrection. And we need to be reminded every day about that running to the tomb and having that, that clarity of the scriptures being explained to us. Yes, we'll move into the Christmas season, and I can hear people say, well, but without Christmas, without the birth of Christ, there's not a resurrection. And that's true. But without the resurrection, there is no being able to follow him. There is no being able to say that we give our life to him. Mary going and doing her job, what she perceived to be her job that day was her giving her, her life to him. The disciples running to the tomb to see for themselves is them giving their life to him. And the question that we have from the gospel writers is what are we going to do now to give our life to him? 
prayer today. Father, we just thank you again for, as always, an opportunity to study your word and to live in an environment where we can provide this for others and maybe raise questions. Um, Father, we just, we can't imagine what it would have been like to be at the tomb that day, except that every morning and every moment that we can have that on what you did for us. Father, we just ask that you provide someone that we can be an example to, and Father, that you continue to provide examples for us, because the only way that we learn and continue to grow is to watch others and to know that others are watching us. We simply ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for watching today. Um, stay safe and uh, stay in touch. And we look forward to a time that we can all be together again.